Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Crystal Evidin and I'm a social cultural anthropologist. So unlike uh, Mika and Tanya who are looking at the level of brands, platforms, and unlike Stina later who will tell you the industry perspective, I'm interested in the people behind this industry. Um, most of my work looks at young people's internet cultures, so things familiar to us like memes, things that go viral, hashtags and images. But the work that I'm going to present today is focused on how people become internet celebrities online. Now as a disclaimer, I'm not like a magician genie guru, so I'm not going to tell you how to become an internet celebrity, but I'm going to be tracking some of these processes. Um, I started working on this in the late 2000s, and we might be surprised to learn that influencers have existed since then. But in different parts of the world, influencers started out as different entities. So for example, in East Asia, from as early as in 2005, they were bloggers. If we look at the US in the late 90s, they were webcam streamers who eventually branched off into, say, doing sex camming. So depending on which part of the world you're in, the concept of influencers has a different origin story, and it also has started on different platforms. Um, to continue, I'm going to talk to you about a few of my favorite influencers on YouTube before giving you some of the research that I've studied. In each of these examples, I have one main point to make. This is Troy Savan. He comes from Perth, Australia, where I live. He's really unique in that when he first started on YouTube, he was just a young boy of about seven. Back then, he was really popular for having a beautiful voice, so all his YouTube videos basically showed him singing songs. But when he came of age and he was a teenager, he started to do face-to-face -face dialoguing and talking hit videos to his fans. And then he got picked up by EMI, a music company, to sign a record label. After that, he started a second YouTube channel, one specifically for his professional music endeavors, and the first one still sticking to all his content as a regular YouTube influencer. All this is just to say that it is possible to hop across genres, and it's also possible to hop between genres on one platform at the same time, as long as you can segment your content and your audiences correctly. Reality Changers from the USA are one of my most favorite, favorite influencers. The kids are so cute. This is the dad, Kohei, his daughter, and the second daughter, Eliana. She's affectionately known on YouTube as Chunky Monkey or the Blueberry Monster because that's what she likes to eat on screen. There are origin stories that Kohei was a single dad with his, his two daughters. So he was doing a live stream every day of how he takes care of his daughters, sometimes putting out video diaries of what it's like to know, learn how to tie their hair, soothe them emotionally, bring them on play dates. But eventually he found out that his daughters had musical talent. So he would record song covers with them, and it became so viral that they were invited to several um, TV shows like The Ellen Show and even invited to things like America's Got Talent or Britain's Got Talent to perform that act again. Now this reunification story is really cool, but what's the most interesting is that these two girls literally grew up on camera. So Eliana, the one who's my favourite with the cheeks, eventually started taking over the camera without her father's supervision. This is apparently a staged video managed entirely by Eliana. Kohei claims that one day he was going through his camera and he found that Eliana set up a camera, danced to it all by herself as a four-year-old and made this video. It shows us in this life story of their YouTube history how these young children are managing technology and self-managing celebrity in these ways outside of their parents guiding them. I found this really interesting and if we have time later, I'm going to be talking more about these types of young children on YouTube being child celebrities. Baby Yebin, has anyone seen this viral video on Facebook? Like five people. Basically, this is a tiny girl speaking to her mom and her mom says, so if a stranger comes up to you and offers you a cookie, what do you say? And she goes, yes, I'll eat it. And her mom says, no, you're supposed to say no to strangers. Okay, good, pass the test. Next question, her mom says, if a stranger wants to take you swimming, what should you do? She goes, yes, I'll go. And mom says, no, you're supposed to go no to strangers. So this goes on and on, and 12 questions in, this girl just says yes to everything and every stranger. This was an accidental video filmed by the mom. She wasn't yet a celebrity, but it went crazy viral, 12 million hits in a matter of weeks. And this young Korean child became a celebrity overnight, just like this. Most of her other videos are not as staged in conversations with her mom. They often just feature her playing with the camera with her mom behind the screen. 
trying to blow kissy videos into the screen, and then when she got a bit older, playing with technology such as using filters. She was so prominent that at age six, she was voted the most prominent South Korean influencer in a very major Southeast Asian influencer awards. And shortly after, her mom gave birth to a little brother, so they're now a sibling duo, celebrity couple on YouTube. How about this? Has anyone seen a video of this woman on viral Facebook videos dancing to food? Just one. Shori is a very young, glamorous, beautiful South Korean woman. Her videos are really unexpected. She usually just poses in front of a camera, smiles very sweetly, and then when there's a drop in the bass in the music, she starts rubbing food all over her body, provocatively, but also in humor. One of my favorites is this one when she's in the fridge. It's to the soundtrack of Little Mermaid's Under the Sea. So she's rubbing like crustaceans, squid, fish all over her body. And there's really nothing that she's advertising. It's just so exciting to watch and you can't look away. There's no point, no commercial message, no information, no social justice undertones. It's just something you can't look away from. It's attractive in a weird, grotesque way that you can't really discern. But Shori has become so big on Facebook and in turn channeling all that viewership back to her other South Korean websites where she then pushes out these messages. So all this is to say that a lot of these influencers also use very interesting attractive devices. You may not be able to see the intention or the product they're trying to sell, but attention grabbing tactics are now increasingly important because it's so saturated on the internet. You basically get no chance of being seen by anyone unless you're really pristine and cultivated or if you do something shocking and exciting like that. In another space like China's Jipua Wang economy, where you've got live streamers who earn money through tokens, this is a very platform-specific internet celebrity. They may not be known at all in other streaming platforms like Twitch or YouTube. And in China alone, there are dozens of these specific live stream video communities. And each of these platforms have their own form of internet celebrity. So they may be known as the equivalent of a Weibo celebrity or a Triple Wang celebrity. Um, and they're tied to their platforms and then tied to companies who best know the algorithms, the back end, and the affordances of platforms. So a lot of influencers do play across several social media, but depending on the system that you're in, some people really only thrive and stick to one. Um, I'll be surprised if nobody has heard of Danielle Brigoli. Anybody? Has anyone heard of the phrase, catch me outside, how about that? No. Do Finnish people go on the internet? So, Danelle Vergoli went viral on YouTube on a Dr. Phil show. She was a wayward teen. She was basically no longer listening to her mom and being disciplined. And at one point, she challenged Dr. Phil to a duo, saying, all right, let's go outside and trash this out. For those of us who don't have context, Dr. Phil is a celebrity therapist that has his own TV show in the US. What is interesting about Danielle Bregoli is that she didn't really create her own internet celebrity herself. When she became viral on the video, the Dr. Phil YouTube channel went back and did several follow-up videos with her. You can even see in the behind the scenes where they went to her house, went to her school, waited outside her door, and she refused to be filmed. That they were pressing upon her. And all these video clips they collected of her behind the scenes were smacked onto their YouTube channel to invite more views and more viewership. Over time though, when Danielle Bregoli realized that she did have good traction based on this explosive celebrity, a shameful act of celebrity, she then started her own YouTube channel, Facebook page, Instagram and app, and she utilized this explosive popularity to then build her brand. All this to say, a lot of times internet celebrities may be intentionally curated, but sometimes they're also accidental and overnight. Peaches Monroe is a really good example of how sometimes celebrity does not equal money. When I'm talking about internet celebrity, I'm really talking about visibility. But just because someone sees a lot of you doesn't mean you actually make money from the viewership or the hits. When Vine was still alive, the golden age of Vine, Peaches Monroe coined the phrase eyebrows on fleek. Soon after that, all the white middle-aged YouTubers, all the young famous Viners, even people like Kim Kardashian started using it. And then brands like Forever 21, ASOS, Urban Outfitters started printing merchandise with the slogan on their brand, but none of the money went back to her. Being upset, since she was the originator of this viral um, incident, she started a crowdfunding website asking people to donate money to her if she enjoyed the content so that she could build her business. 
but that has not proven to be very successful so far. My last example, I really only want to make one point. Internet celebrities are not all human. Grumpy Cat, probably one of the most loved cats on the internet, is also an internet celebrity. You may call him a pet influencer. Forbes surely does, since it was named the most influential pet influencer of the year for several years running. So I've been using this phrase internet celebrity a lot, and it seems as though these are just people who do funny things on social media, scary things on social media that attract your attention. But I also mentioned earlier on that depending on where you are in the world, the history of internet celebrity is also very old. So in my 101 professor hat, I'm going to give you a quick two and a half minute lecture on the history of internet celebrity. Um, this is very particular, I would say, to an Anglo-West space. But really, if you think about celebrities as in mainstream celebrities versus internet celebrities, the earliest, earliest origin stories are in reality TV. In reality TV, sorry, I'm going to go back, in the celebrity and star industry. So first, in the mainstream celebrity industry, everything is a system. Before a star is debuted in a cinema or in a song, they are groomed. Something as transparent as the Korean K-pop industry shows us these steps along the way. So celebrity in the traditional sense, pre the internet, was not accidental. You couldn't go viral overnight. It was something you practiced and did. But then in step two, we started to see more ordinary people on screen. They may say, come on TV talk shows. It may be a road show where you interview people on the street. You may even meet competitions where people come on The Biggest Loser to lose weight, or a cooking contest, or a plastic surgery contest. But all of a sudden, human beings who were not traditional celebrities were given visibility in the mainstream media. And it became so exciting to watch these normal humans like you and I on screen. That made us feel more connected to them. You felt more intimate. It almost feels as if everything they achieve, you can also achieve because they're a normal person just like you and I. But in the third step in reality TV, we take this one step further, where you see the ordinary person performing on screen, but you also see behind the scenes when they're doing trash talk, where they're crying, where they have a scandal, on shows like Big Brother, for example. This promises you that they're giving you a real glimpse at real life. Even though at the back of our minds, we still have some understanding and a lot of this is constructed and staged. In the fourth stage, now moving on to social media, we realize that there are very specific strategies you can use to cultivate relationships with your viewers. Back in the day of radio, it could be someone on the radio going, oh, we'll come back to this radio show. It's nice to have you with us. If you think about it, they're imagining the audience. They don't know you're there. Think about television, when a camera zooms on me as I'm about to shed a tear in this close-up interview. It almost feels as if this moment is bringing you closer to the actor. On social media though, there are ways we can do this. If I, for example, am giving a talk here and I want to seem more relatable, it could be that one minute before coming up here, I'll put out a tweet going, oh my god, I'm so nervous, I wonder how all these people would think what I'm doing. And you, having read that tweet, and having seen me perform here, would feel as if I, you have been taken into the back stream of my consciousness because you get to see something that most people do not access. So this brings us to the idea of micro-celebrity that Tanya talked about um, earlier on. The idea that now on the internet, anyone can be a celebrity with high visibility. But there are two distinctions here. With the mass media in that celebrity, your audience and visibility is extensive. Everybody knows you, but they probably just know a bit about you. They know who your husband is, they know where you live, they know the shows that you, you've starred in. For a micro-celebrity, your visibility may be small, perhaps only a few hundred thousand people know you, or if you're PewDiePie, a few million people know you. It's much, much smaller in scale, but the depth is crazy astounding. I know everything down to the color of your underwear, the name of your pet, your birthday, your favorite vegetable, because of this continuous acts of disclosure. So the scale and the extent of celebrity pre-internet and on the internet has really shifted radically. Things brings me to my research that's mostly been on influencers. As I've said, almost anyone can be an internet celebrity. But influencers are the epitome of this business where their entire lifestyles are commodified, where this is a vocation they do full time as a job. It's no longer like in Silicon Valley where I use apps to promote my business. This time, my entire lifestyle is a canvas to embed products for messages. Right. 
So um, in a forthcoming book that I have, I describe very briefly for a general audience what qualities an internet celebrity has. And I think very chiefly, anything that gets your attention on the internet falls into these four categories. The first is exclusivity. It's mostly a type of celebrity that's very glamorous. They usually put, do have possessions that are very elite, or they have access to practices that are very rare that you don't commonly see. Most of the time, this is also attached to high economic capital. You like watching these people on the internet because they do what you can't and they have what you don't. A very good example of this are the rich kids of Instagram and why they're so proliferate on a visual based driven platform like Instagram. The second quality that a lot of internet celebrities have is exoticism. This really links when we think about cross-cultural links. For example, Kinoshita Yuka from Japan is a really famous mukbang eater and live streamer. Literally all she does is sit in front of the computer and then eat copious amounts of food. And I mean copious like 100 McDonald's cheeseburgers in one sitting or 48 pieces of KFC chicken. This is a very normal mukbang live streaming practice all throughout East Asia. But within East Asia, she is an amazing celebrity because A, she's a woman when most of these participants are men. B, she's really, really skinny for a binge eater compared to the idea of the American hot dog eating champions that are usually burly or muscular. And C, she actually looks quite beautiful for someone engaging in such a grotesque and scary act. And she does this very gracefully. So because there is a cultural shift or there is a distance between who we imagine this person to be and how they present themselves, she has exotic celebrity attached to her. Similarly with Shori, she's really popular against the backdrop of pristine, perfect, beautiful South Korean internet celebrities. Always glamorous, always showing you makeup. Think about the girls in K-pop that you know of, always perfect. And here she is making a fool of herself unabashedly, very happy to take on humor rather than beauty in her celebrity. The second last quality we have is exceptionalism. This is quite traditional. We like to celebrate people who have expert skills, who are very technical or who are trained. Oftentimes, these are very beautiful videos, such as Sunga Jung, who is a South Korean guitarist. Um, as a young boy, he really exhibited really amazing skills on guitar, and he became a celebrity just based on his skills live streaming on YouTube. But because this is the internet and the internet is weird and we are weird people on the internet, your skills don't actually have to be useful for you to be an internet celebrity based on exceptionalism. This is Miss Ye from Sichuan in China. Her expert skills include being able to cook edible hygienic meals using only office utensils. So here she is using a hair dryer and a coffee pot to make a waffle. But in other instances, she has torn up parts of a computer of her CPU with wires and candles to make like steak or hamburgers in the office. Yes, very skilled, probably a person you want to be trapped on an island with. Probably also not very useful in life, but it's still exciting to watch what she's going to do next. The last quality of internet celebrity is everydayness. This is quite different from the first three in that it's a feeling of consistence and regularity. Because of the constant and continuous exposure to these people, you feel as if their lifestyles and rhythms match yours. So much so that you're always looking forward to the next update. This is nap time with Joey, they are Asian Americans. Um, her mom cosplays her when she's asleep and when she was much younger and not so wriggly as a toddler, we got at least one picture a day where she was a sushi, when she was Jon Snow from Game of Thrones and depending on trends, when that pine, pen pineapple apple pen video came out, she dressed up as Pico Taro or when Pokemon Go was trending, she dressed up as Pikachu. So her mom responds to the social rhythms of everyday life and at the same time, you have that continuous daily rhythms expecting updates from her. This is Xiao Man from China. Um, she's just literally a baby who eats every day and her parents upload a video of her eating every day at the same time. Not very exciting. She's also really cute, but because it's regular and it's something you can attract yourself to and cling on to, those rhythms build up. Right, I'm very aware that I have just a couple of minutes left. So I am going to just give you two final slides to summarize some of the work that I have done. I'm going to do one on Singapore and then one on Sweden, since these are my two field sites. Um, as an anthropologist, I'm very interested in how young people become celebrities on the internet 
and I spent time not just on social media looking at them. For a good number of months, spread out across many years, I went to live with influencers. So this meant being their personal assistant, helping them with their bags when they went to events, helping them take photos, sometimes helping them to reply to their fan mail or accompanying them to events. But I also embedded an influencer management in agencies in Singapore to learn what it was like behind the scenes. On a typical Friday night, the third Friday of every month, this was what my field site looked like. I was somewhere in the picture. You have influencers, both male and female, taking photos of the event. Bancho the mud rep is my favorite because I've known him since 2012 and I've never seen him without his glasses, whether in the flesh or on screen. And this is important to note. Singapore is a multiracial country, but about 75% of these people are Chinese and Bancho belongs to a minority race of Malays that make up just about 10 to 12%. Because of this, it's very easy for the mainstream um, of mainstream audience to confuse brown actors. Not all brown people look the same. So to distinguish himself from the rest of the minorities, he puts on these shades that he has never taken off. So I don't actually know what he looks like. Um, who else is in the influencer ecology? These people in the middle, these are your influencer managers. They take care of the influencers, broker deals for them, uh, make sure they submit their work on time, but at the same time, ensure that they fulfill their duties to their clients. Person with the bunny twists and the people at the back. Some of these people might be your accounts managers, some of them are your engineers. Because they are influencers with high profile social media, a lot of their estates are prone to attack and hex. So these people protect them. Um, unfortunate person drinking beer at the back with the other people, these are your clients. They also often come to meet with influencers in the flesh now to verify that they have a good personality. It's no, longer not enough, it's no longer enough to just look okay and good on screen. They also expect you to be able to command the crowd in this space like that. Last but not least, there are some young boys and women in the second room at the back. These are your fans and they often win contests like hashtag contests, tweet, tweet contests in order to attend these parties. For some time, these are promoted as um, events where you can come and take selfies with your favorite influencer. So in one snapshot, for all of us who may not know what the influencer industry looks like, it's way beyond just the face of that celebrity you see on YouTube and there's a whole other ecology. Final comments. This has been my most recent research looking at influencer agencies in Sweden, and it's so diverse and rich, I'm so impressed. You have anything from Cure, who literally are your traditional influencer agencies who manage influencers, but also Cube. They don't manage influencers, they create personalities or icons, meaning you're not only good for social media, you're good to be a radio star, you're good to star on television. It's about grooming an entire package. You also have people like Loppy. Now increasingly looking at very minute, confined societies, Loppy is for only bloggers and only mom bloggers. You have United Screens that only works with YouTubers. You have Buzzador, which works with people who have fewer than 500 followers. So very, very micro, micro, micro influencers. You have people like Noise Goyden, who is actually a print magazine, but are now using influencers to push out their free newspapers. And finally, you have Relatable, who's not really interested in all of this, but what they do is manage back-end structures and processes to automate things for the industry. I hope this has been useful, um, and if you're interested, this is going to take time. If you are interested, yes, please feel free to contact me at wishchris.com, and also please help yourself to a flyer outside on a forthcoming book. Thank you.